So we got a nice, uh, nice tight crowd, as I like to call it. Uh, so we can keep things very interactive here. Uh, don't hesitate to interrupt me with questions or any thoughts you might have around what it is I'm about to show you today. And what that is, is something that's actually, I've found been kind of a common theme already at ApacheCon here, and that's how to build community. And there's been a lot of different strategies discussed. Mark Hinkle discussed some, uh, James Waters discussed some others during his talk about Cloud Foundry. And I'm here to discuss another tactic for getting contribution and, and building your community through contribution. So my name is Everett Taves. I'm a developer advocate at Rackspace in the developer relations group there. And I do still get the question often enough, practically every conference, you know, what does a developer advocate do? What do, what do these types of people even do, right? So, I mean, first and foremost, I am a developer. I'm an engineer. I write code of one kind or another. For, it, it varies. Uh, it can be 50% of the time one month, 70% of the time another month, 20% of the time another month. But I'm always engineering in some way, shape, or form some portion of my time. And I'm a project management committee member and committer on Apache JClouds. JClouds is actually the Java SDK for Rackspace and OpenStack. It's the official SDK for those clouds. And it's also the SDK for the HP cloud as well. And the advocate part of the job, that's the, uh, the guy you see standing here before you today. He's the one that goes out to conferences and, and different events, meetups, user groups, hackathons, basically wherever I'm needed. And I, I really like the term advocate as opposed to evangelist because evangelist implies very much a, a one-way form of communication. And I don't, I don't care for that at all. Uh, not only am I an advocate of Rackspace and OpenStack, I'm also an advocate of the users of those clouds, of those services. So they're not perfect, and if there's something wrong with them, I'd like to know about and bring that feedback into our organizations and constantly make it better and better and better. So it's very much a two-way street. And this is me here right now talking to you at a conference. But if you'll notice, it's actually, this is how much I thought I was doing this in the Platte River room. It's from that room. And I've done a, a fair bit of operations in my time at a previous job. I actually built the first OpenStack cloud in Canada with one region in Alberta and one region in Quebec linked by a high-speed research network. And that was four or five years ago now. So, so quite a while ago. But I helped co-author the OpenStack Operations Guide. This was a book we actually wrote in five days. It was more like three, three and a half days we wrote it and edited it down into something hopefully uh, readable. And then O'Reilly picked it up and they'll be publishing it next month. Uh, and I can take off that stupid early release, raw and unedited part for the book. And you can, if you don't care for dead tree versions, just go ahead and get the free version. <laughs> okay, anyway. So talking about documentation and contributing to documentation. I mean, one of the things we've all heard from any kind of documentation, whether it's open source or not, is that it's typically awful. Developers, users always say, you know, God, the documentation is just awful. I can't get started. It makes no sense. It's poorly laid out. Blah, 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 blah. Just grief, grief, grief is all you hear about documentation. Ugh. It's painful, right? It's ugly. Oh, I can't stand the look of it. JCloud's actually had the ugliest site for the longest time. Um, it literally, literally looked like a tombstone. Um, it had this, this gray background with this like headpiece up at the top and it looked like a, a tombstone. Common complaint, it just, it looks awful. It's not using, you know, some of the, the nicer tools. It's not, um, what's the word, reactive, responsive. It's not responsive on mobile devices or, or smaller screen sizes. 
It's at a date. This is a really tough one. You gotta make your documentation easy to contribute to so you can keep it up to date. And if you don't, it's out of date, it's basically bit rot. Your software is moving so fast that it's hard to keep up with the documentation of it. Documenting the new features, documenting the refactorings, all the different things that it takes to make a whole software project is part, in part documentation, but it's so easy for that documentation to fall behind. It's non-discoverable. Well, I couldn't even find the damn thing, right? You know, when you're trying to scale a project, you can't answer every single question every single time, whether it's IRC or mailing lists or whatever. You need people to be able to find the documentation so that they can answer the questions themselves, especially if you're getting those questions often. It's hard to change. You see something wrong, but what am I gonna do about it? What can I do about it? Sometimes there's no avenue to actually change the documentation. You want to improve the documentation yourself, but you can't. It could be some obvious little fix, a typo that's preventing you from copying and pasting and, and running a quick demo. And these kinds of things, these kinds of getting started tutorials are so very important and they're also quite easy to get out of date. And if you can't make that change to you know, get rid of that extraneous semicolon or whatever the heck it is that's causing it to not compile or not run properly. It's hard to change and it gets out of date. But documentation can be awesome. There are people who get it right, but it's a really tough nut to crack. But it can be awesome. It can be beautiful and responsive on your mobile devices. And it just looks great, well laid out, lots of space, easy to read. And it's up to date. It actually knows, the website knows about the latest version of your software so that the examples that are in the documentation are actually always using the latest version of your project. It's discoverable. It's got a good information architecture. Maybe it's got a little Google search bar up in the top right corner, or maybe it's Logstash or Elasticsearch, or not Logstash, but Elasticsearch, something like that, providing search into your site, making it easy for people to find the information that they're looking for. They don't want to go to the mailing list. They don't want to go to IRC. They want to get the information that they need easily and move on themselves. And there are sites where it's easy to change. The ACA framework does a good job of this on their site being able to, to fix the, the different pages. The OpenStack documentation, while it's not actually making the pages easy to change, they certainly make it easy for users to report bugs about pages. So there's different levels of making your site easy to change, reducing, that, reducing the time and that feedback loop between when your users find a documentation problem and when they can actually do something about it, anything about it. But Documentation is hard to change in so many cases. It's just brutal, really. There's a whole host of problems that people need to overcome, barriers for them to overcome, just to be able to make a change to your documentation. Permissions is a huge one. It's so easy to get tripped up on the permissions of enabling someone to make a change to your documentation, whatever service it is that you're using, wherever you're hosting your documentation, and you don't want to give them too much permissions because maybe they're not a, a trusted contributor yet. They're just someone who's new to the project, but they want to contribute in some way, but uh, you know, I, I, the permissions aren't fine-grained enough in my system and I have to give them you know, right access to everything, but I don't really want to, stuff like that. The people that are part of the documentation you know, who are kind of focused on documentation in your project, they can be a significant hurdle in, you know, making documentation hard to change. They might be just fine with the status quo, or they simply don't have the time to put in the effort to make documentation easy to change. There are a lot of different formats out there for documentation. And they come in a, a variety of 
you know, usefulness and how well they're understood and how, how well they're known, how ubiquitous they are. Uh, a common complaint against the OpenStack documentation is that it's almost primarily written in DocBook. And there's a lot of really good reasons for that. Uh, just for the way that they format the output. They have a whole tool chain that formats the output and, and spits it out into all these different pages with search and everything. And it's easy to translate. They find that it's a format that really helps translation and that's a huge piece for the documentation team in OpenStack. But nobody knows DocBook, everybody hates XML, and it's super painful, and it's one of the most common complaints about OpenStack documentation. And I kind of alluded to it there, but the tool chain. Most documentation systems come with some sort of tool chain, whether it's a custom tool chain or something kind of off the shelf, something open source. The thing is, not everyone is gonna be familiar with that tool chain. In fact, they're almost likely, most likely not going to be familiar with that tool chain. And even if they are, in fact, especially if they are, they probably already have it installed on their system. So if you have the same tool chain as them, it's probably a different version though. So you're saying, oh, you know what, you need to install this version of Ruby and, and that version of Jekyll, or you, know, you need to install Maven 2 because our documentation system is super old and it's got some conflict with your local Maven. You know, stuff like this. Tool chains can make it really hard to change documentation. People have to understand them and how they work, and all the bits and pieces. It goes on and on and on. This is one of the biggest hurdles. But in terms of that one crucial thing, developer time, both on the side of the person making the contribution and on the side of the committer who's reviewing that contribution and saying, okay, this makes sense, this is good, this can go into the documentation. It's so crucial to cut down on the review time, to make it easy, super, super easy for the committer to make that review and for the contributor to respond to those review comments and reduce the time in that feedback cycle so that you can make an update to the documentation again and start over and keep doing that until it's right, until you've got it fully up to date and where it should be and you've got a quality contribution. So, we can make documentation easy to change. There is a way. It does take some effort and it's really all about making it super easy for the contributor and quite a bit easier for the committer. But it's okay that you know, it might be a little more difficult for the committer. Really, what I'm trying to focus on here is lowering the barriers for the contributor. Just make it practically drop dead simple for them. So absolutely, anyone should be able to contribute to your do documentation, regardless of permissions or what have you. Anyone should be able to come in and say, okay, I wanna fix this page on your site, no problem. The people that comprise your project need to buy into this as well. They need to understand the benefits. And once they see these kinds of things in action and how it reduces the review time, how it benefits them, you can remove that barrier too. So the people who are you know, interested in the status quo can say, oh, you know what, there is a better path this way. You wanna use common formats. Of course, HTML is uh, a widely understood format, although it's also incredibly complex when you throw in CSS and everything. Markdown is another very common format, uh, uh, quite a bit simpler, but it does require a tool to actually generate HTML for the sites. And speaking of tools, you wanna to provide common tools to your contributors so that they can easily make changes to your documentation. I mean, ideally, just the most basic things that absolutely every single person has, whether they're a developer or not. As common as absolutely possible. And you wanna make those reviews drop dead simple. 
reducing the time, and just making it a very smooth contribution, make it a great experience, a great contribution experience, a great developer experience. Okay, so how does JClouds actually enable walk-up contributions to documentation? So it's a combination of the people and the technology that really enable this. We start with GitHub. JClouds was born in GitHub. That's where Adrian Cole started the project some little over four years ago now. And that's where we continue to be. That's the workflow we know. That's the workflow our committers know. That's the workflow our contributors know. And you know, with the, the, the great work that's going on at, at the Apache Software Foundation with Git and you know, kind of embracing these kinds of GitHub workflows it made it really easy for us to come in through the incubator process and become a top level project all the while continuing to use GitHub. Making contributions solely from the web browser. So this is key. This is one of the, one of the really most important parts is that anybody can make a contribution to the JCloud's documentation strictly using their web browser. That's the only tool they need, that's it. The formats they need to be kinda comfortable with are Markdown and to kind of a lesser extent, HTML. Most of our pages are almost entirely Markdown, but some of the template stuff, there's quite a bit of HTML, although it's, it's relatively simple. We also use uh, Bootstrap. But for most contributions, these kinds of walk-up contributions, they're not gonna be changing the templates, they're not gonna be changing the overall look and feel of the site. So typically, the contributions are happening in Markdown and that's just drop dead simple. And in most cases, you're just typing in paragraphs without actually marking up anything at all. To actually generate the site, to take that markdown and the templates and all kind of, you know, some of the variables from the pages and the variables, the site wide variables, and to merge them all together, you know, and the atom feeds and the blog posts, and to bring it all together, we use Jekyll. So Jekyll is a static site generator, and it's written in Ruby. You can install it with, via gems. And it's quite painful to use in some cases when you're trying to actually install it. Uh, first of all, um, I, I just recently got a, a new laptop and I had to reinstall my Jekyll environment. Being a committer, I, I do really kind of need to have it on my machine. It just takes a long time to install. Like literally, uh, I don't know how many minutes it takes to install after you've downloaded it and then it's, I don't know what exactly it's doing in the background there. And then you also have to use RVM with it or I mean they recommend using RVM with it. And that's the, the Ruby virtual machine manager thing, the Ruby kind of an environment manager. It's like a virtual end for Python. We don't really have the same kind of concept in the, the Java world so much because we can just create a directory of jars if we need per project, and it's, it's really quite simple. So anyway, we use Jekyll as our static site generator for the JCloud's website, for our documentation. We use Jenkins to automate a whole bunch of stuff in the background that enables lowering all these barriers, that enables these walk-up contributions. So it runs a bunch of automated processes, it runs Jekyll, it runs some JCloud stuff, and it just makes it easy for everyone, it just automates everything. JClouds is actually really fortunate to have this great relationship with CloudBees. CloudBees is one of these, uh, I, I think they build themselves as a, a platform as a service company, uh, but that's, we don't really kind of use that at all. Uh, we basically use them as Jenkins as a service. Uh, so we have a whole ton of uh, Jenkins jobs that do a lot of our continuous integration and also run our, our doc jobs. We use JClouds itself, of course. Uh, you know, we want to dog food JClouds, use it wherever we can. We use JClouds itself and actually some of the examples, some of the example code that JClouds provides to our users. So we're using the same examples day in, day out that we ask our users to take in and use themselves. So we know these examples are always running. We have nightly jobs that, that run the examples as well to make sure they're 
always working and in tip-top shape. And then the last piece of the puzzle is using Rackspace cloud files. Because Jekyll is a static site generator, you can actually just throw that entire site into an object storage system. It could be anything, actually. It could have been S3, it could have been Azure, but you know, obviously, me working for Rackspace, I was able to get us free space on our cloud file system in our object storage piece known as cloud files. And so you just throw all the HTML files up there and tell cloud files that this is a static site, deploy it on our content distribution network. And that makes it available for everyone to see. And I'll show you how that enables, that's one of the key pieces that makes the reviews really, really easy. So let's go ahead and make a contribution. Hopefully Wi-Fi is in good shape and everything. This is always the, the fun part. But before we actually do uh, get into the nuts and bolts, so I'm gonna be playing two roles up here while I'm actually doing this. So as the contributor role, I'm just gonna be in my T-shirt and in an incognito browser tab because I need to be making the contribution as a different GitHub user. So contributor, T-shirt, incognito. Committer, I'll put the hoodie back on and I'll be in my regular browser space working as my usual GitHub user. Okay, so we're gonna start by going to jclouds.apache.org. And I'm gonna go there first as a contributor. Everyone can see that okay? Maybe a little bit small. I'll, I'll increase the size on, on the next page. So okay, so you know, blah, 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 I'm a user, uh, and I wanna use, uh, I want to use JClouds, so I, I, look at the, I look for the documentation, and oh, I want to be guided through using JClouds, so let me look at these, these user guides. I'm gonna to want to use Rackspace, and there's this whole getting started guide intro, how you get a username and API key from the developer discount, how you actually get JClouds itself, blah, blah, blah. What's this? Well, this looks like a command but it's not formatted the same as all the other commands on the page. That ain't right. Let's, I'll, I'll increase the size here. You know what, that's, that's something I should be able to fix pretty easily. Okay, well, let me keep that in mind. And blah, 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 I, I keep reading through. Uh, support and feedback, you know, here's where you go. Fix this page. Okay, well, I remember I wanted to fix that little piece there. Let's, let's go ahead and see what this does. So this actually takes us to the jclouds wiki and we kind of very purposefully separated the, the user documentation from the developer documentation. So now that we're kind of more in contri contributor and developer side of things, now we're on the wiki. So how do I actually contribute to documentation? So it says, Contributing documentation or a guest blog post is easy. Okay, great. Uh, and entire, done entirely from within your web browser. So in summary, what is it I'm gonna be doing? I'm gonna find the page I wanna fix. I'm gonna change it one way or another or maybe even add a completely new page. I'm gonna commit that change. I'm gonna wait a little bit. I'm gonna get a review from a committer. Based on that review, I might have to update something and then loop back and make another change and go through the process again, and then I'll be done, and my contribution will be complete. Hurrah. So first off, let's find the actual thing we want to change. We wanna find that, that Rackspace guide. So go to the jcloud site and find the doc you wanna change. The website directory structure mimics the GitHub site, so files are easy to find. So let's go here. Okay, so let's see. So it kind of gives you an example here if you were to, wanted to change, say, the chef guide. 
So I look here in my location bar, guides, rack space, okay? Guides, rack space. Now, just as kind of an aside here, I think this is something that I could make even easier for the users. Uh, I just need to find out how on each page, within the, the fix this page link, write in some JavaScript or something that just instantly takes you to the GitHub file associated with the page. And so you wind up right there, boom, you don't have to go through this looking for your own page thing. It's kind of, it's too much, it's too complicated. But for now, this suffices. Okay, so here I am. I wanna make this change to this Rackspace markdown file. So, and here's what it looks like rendered by GitHub. This isn't actually what it looks like rendered by, by Jekyll and the site, but it's close-ish. Uh, so there's the introduction we saw before, and username, API key, blah, blah, blah. Oh, here it is. So that's what I wanna change. Okay, so I found it. Now what? I wanna make a change. So to edit a page, click on the edit button for that file. Make your edits and click on the preview button to ensure nothing is obviously wrong. Okay. So go back to the top here, edit. And so now I've got this, this kind of nice editing pane where things are actually highlighted. GitHub's aware that this is marked down, so, so things are nicely highlighted. And I find that command I want to change. And I see that the other commands are surrounded by back ticks. Okay, so really all I'm gonna do here is add some back ticks. Color change, so I must have done something right. Click on preview to make sure nothing's painfully, obviously wrong. Okay, so it renders the same as the other commands do on the page. Alrighty, so now what? So I've changed it. Now I wanna commit this change. So below the editing window, fill out a, the commit summary field, it, just like you would with any other pull request that you're creating for a change that you've made. And you know you can fill in the description, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then on the next page, follow the instructions to create the pull request. So go back to the code bit here. So this is at the bottom. I'm gonna say I codify the maven command. Might want to be a little more descriptive, but you know how it goes. So now, <laughs> because I've actually, of course, run through this before, normally what would happen is if this was the very, very, very first time you were actually making a, a contribution to the jcloud site from your GitHub user, it would automatically fork the repo, the jcloud site repo, in the background and add it to your list of repos that you've forked. All happens in the background, you don't even have to worry about it. And it creates a branch for you automatically. And because I've done this already once, that was called patch one. But now that I'm doing this a second time, it's created another branch in that fork called patch two. So now, we've got this branch, and we're gonna create a pull request out of it. Oh, and look, it shows me the changes that I've made so I can review exactly what it is that I've done. I've just added some back ticks, and this is kind of a funky feature, this is a newer feature of GitHub, where you can actually diff rendered documents, so you can see that this has been removed and has been replaced with this, red and struck out, and green and rendered. That's a pretty neat, uh, pretty neat feature. I guess GitHub found something to do with that, whatever it was, $100 million that they got. <laughs> So that's, that's good to see, okay. So we're gonna create this pull request and we're gonna fire it off. Click button, go now. Okay, so it's created the pull request in the jclouds organization, in the jclouds repo, pull request 73. And we didn't provide a description, we've just got our commit message here. You can see the commit, and the file's changed. Okay, so now what do I do? As a, as a contributor, now what do I do? 
I wait. So it gives me a little bit of information as to kind of exactly what's going on here and encourages me to, to subscribe to the mailing list and, and maybe get a little more deeper involved in the community now that I'm making a contribution. So I should eventually see a comment that reads, success, success is good, and then wait a bit longer for this kind of review, this weird looking review comment in the pull request itself. So now that the pull request has actually been submitted to the repo, I'm going to costume change here. And now I'm acting as myself, the committer, who's going to be reviewing the change in the pull request. So as myself, <laughs> okay, as myself, um, you know, I would see an email that comes into uh, our notifications at jclouds.apache.org. Uh, we pipe all of uh, you know, all of these sorts of notification emails from GitHub into that mailing list. And I would see that and I'd go, go to the, the pull request queue and see this new pull request from this, this contributor that I've never even heard of before. Someone came out of the blue and did this. Oh, things are moving along already. So what's going on here? So as a committer, I'm reviewing this person's work. And there are a couple things going on in the background that Jenkins is doing for us. So we can see that the CloudBees pull request builder, which is just a Jenkins job, has actually already made a comment. So let's have a look, see what it actually did for us. So we've got this, I need to log in here. Jenkins is the king of forgetting who you are, or at least the way uh, in the, the CloudBees deployment, anyway. So let's see if we can get this to a readable state. Okay, that's not too bad, except for that whole ugly top part. Okay, well, so in this execute shell part of this job, it's just installing Jekyll, installing the latest and greatest, and generating the site. Actually, it's the next step that generates the site. Jekyll build, so all this job is doing is building the site for us and putting it, stitching it all together, essentially compiling it, you can think of it that way, so we know that there's nothing obviously wrong with the contribution. There's nothing that caused Jekyll to crash or error out in any way when we see that success comment in the pull request. So this success comment means that the site built okay by Jekyll, by this job. And then the last thing it does is spits out the GitHub pull request number to a little file. And that's for the downstream job that's actually gonna deploy the site to Rackspace Cloud Files. And it archives the site so, that, so it can be available to the downstream job, and then it triggers this downstream job. So we've got one job that builds the site, and then we've got this other job that stages the site. And by that, all I mean is it uploads it to Rackspace Cloud Files. Okay, so let's have a look at that job. So what is this thing doing? Oh, this is, just looks beautiful. Make it go away. All right. All right, to make it even reasonably legible, I think I, I gotta go there. So, not, not a big deal. Um, so the first part of this job, this just describes what the job is doing overall. Uh, I really commented this stuff heavily, uh, just in case somebody else needs to understand it at a, a later time, like myself. Um, source some variables that we keep in the 
uh, the the private area of our of our CloudBees accounts. Um, move that GitHub PR number into a place where we can use it. And then we delete some stuff, some release note text files that are like huge that we don't need, really need to bother uploading every time. Okay, now here we get to the meat of it. We install jclouds. So to do this, all we do is download IV and use that to install pretty much the, the minimal amount of jclouds that we can use to do an upload to an object storage, in this case, cloud files. Then we go and get the example directly from the, the example that uploads sites to an object storage, and we download that to this Jenkins instance. So we go and get the example from GitHub, and we just throw the source onto this Jenkins instance. And there are a couple of files associated with that. There's this constants file, and then here's the one that actually does the work, this upload directly to cdn.java. This is a, a file that utilizes jclouds to upload entire directories. And then we go ahead and compile and run the app. So nothing too special here, just compiling it. And kind of the only interesting th thing here is that we have to include the Rackspace username and API key from that private area of CloudBees that we sourced earlier. So this is the part that actually really does the work. This is the part that uploads our entire site, the entire jcloud site, up to cloud files. And it does it in a, a multi-threaded way, so it, it's reasonably quick. I mean, it's, it's already done. And then the last piece of the puzzle, to make it really easier for the committer and the contributor to review this thing, to come together in the pull request and review this thing, is this bit here. It's a script that basically just comments on the pull request and says, this is where the site was uploaded to, so both of you can go review it. So both of you can go review the change. So I just source some environment variables that the script is gonna need. I install this Python package called pygithub. It's just an SDK for GitHub written in Python. And then I run this script that I wrote, this comment.py. Again, it's stored in the, the private area of our CloudBees account. And all this thing does is generate a message and use that message to comment on the pull request that this change relates to. And that is what generates this comment here. So we have uh, another account, kind of a dummy account, called jcloud's commentator. And it goes ahead, and that's the account we use to comment on pull requests like this. And so go to this funky URL to review your changes. And this is just uh, a consequence. This is of enabling the content distribution network on this particular container in cloud files. It's actually pretty easy to use DNS, uh, CNames, to do a, a nice domain name for that, but it's not even worth it in this case. So we go ahead and we go there, both as the committer and as the contributor too, because the contributor wanna make sure that everything is as they intended it to be. So we're at this funky URL and it's just the jcloud site as we saw it before, as it's actually deployed out normally on Apache SVN pub sub, is that what it's called? Yep. Okay, so let's go look at the change we made. Okay, there it is. Okay, so it does look like all of the other ones. Good contribution. As a committer, I say plus one. This is a good way to go. You know, it looks good to me. Now here's where it gets just a little bit different from the usual kind of GitHub workflow. 
normally if this was just a GitHub project, I would click a button and be done with it. But of course, our canonical repos are hosted by Apache. So there's an extra step, actually an extra couple steps, that I as the Okay. <laughs> Somebody left a couple scones back here. <laughs> anyway. Okay, so now I'm going to go ahead and as the committer, I've got on my laptop here a clone of the canonical ASF Git repo for the jcloud site. I'm going to make sure it's all nice and up to date. And now I'm going to fetch, and I, there, there was one other command that I had to do uh, before to add the DRG bot, that's the, uh, the user I'm, that's actually making the contribution here, uh, that I had to add their repo to my list of repos I, so I can just easily fetch their branches. So I go ahead and I fetch all the new stuff from the DRG bot. And I see that, oh, there it is. There's that commit. There's that branch where they were making this contribution from. Can you see that okay? It's all right? Okay. So now I need one little piece of information here. And I, I could get this from the command line as well. I need the SHA from GitHub to identify the commit. And I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to cherry pick that into our canonical repo. So I'm cherry picking from the contributor's branch into the canonical repo. So now I've got that commit. And because I'm already, I already get pulled, everything's up to date, and there are no sort of conflicts or anything. Um, I use this uh, tool that, that lets me know what branch I'm on. This should actually be a plus one. I don't know when this tool broke, uh, but if there were conflicts, there'd be like a little radiation symbol telling, telling me the, the file that actually was in conflict. Anyway, just a handy little tool. So now, my local repo here is a commit ahead of the canonical ASF get repo. So I have to push the change that the contributor made up to the ASF canonical repo. And that's just a git push. And there's a, a .net RC file in here that has my ASF credentials that allows me to just push like that, no problem. So done. That, that contribution is made, that commit has been made to the ASF, uh, the ASF git canonical repo. But there's one more step that I need to do as a committer. I actually need to deploy this change to the SVN pub sub. And we just have a little script for that. Deploy site, and I need to give it my, my Apache username, and my Apache password. And that go, goes ahead and takes my local installation of Jekyll and bombs out on something or other, a legal target for the requested operation. Cool. Well, this happens in demos, as we all know. Um, so the, the atom.xml is already in version control. That's, that was to be expected. Um, and, and we can see that it wanted to send the, let me move that up. We can see that it wanted to send the change for the guide for that index, the, the change that I made there. Uh, could not add all targets. Some targets are already versioned. The legal target for the requested operation. Okay, so anyway, you know, at this point, I would go into the site that actually, and this is where my, and see, subversion tells me everything's okay. So anyway, I'm not going to debug this here now. But this is that one extra step that would actually take that change and put it on the, deploy it on the jcloud site so that when we go to, 
our actual site, we would see the change there. And I'm sure it's something ridiculous and small. Um, so where does that leave us? So all of our pages contain this fix this page link. And I should be able to improve that to make it even a little bit easier for people to find the pages that they want to fix. And then I've already taken us on a tour uh, of the back end. Uh, I just left this here because I'll be uploading these slides. Uh, you know, that could be used for reference later. You know, here's our, our jobs, our, our Cloudbees jobs. These are actually not public. Um, so this link wouldn't actually really work for you. This was just a, a reference for myself, really. But ultimately, what we're trying to do here is build community. So it's really, in the end, not just about documentation, although that's you know, a, a really great side effect, and it's super important that you have great documentation and it's easy to change. It's really about building community through contribution. When you can actually engage your users to the point where they're actually making contributions back, that's a whole nother level of engagement. And you know, you can go on and on and on about the, the numbers of people and how they, they move through kind of a life cycle of, of their level of engagement. And if you can get them contributing, that's, that's really kind of a special thing. And so you know, we're always looking for more contributors to JClouds, of course. We're looking to build our community. So I present to all of you uh, something of a challenge. We have our blog at jclouds.apache.org slash blog, where we kind of, this is something that, that we've kind of rebooted since we got our, our new site layout. We're trying to be a bit more active about blogging about what it is we're doing. And we've also made it, with this system, really easy to write a guest blog post. So if any of you are inclined to go to that URL, you can follow the write a guest post link from there. And I invite you to blog about this session, blog about ApacheCon in general. Um, if you happen to use JClouds in some way, it'd be, it's always great to hear from our users and how they actually use it. Uh, and if nobody actually does write a blog post, I won't be offended. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much. Uh, you know, please check out uh, Apache J Clouds. <laughs>